Okay, so uh, after this uh, very uh, short break, uh, we have uh, the pleasure of uh, having with us Professor Anke, who is uh, who's the, lead, uh, the lead of uh, the uh, Emperor Preserved uh, program. We understand after th this great success uh, uh, is very, very busy, and it's a great pleasure uh, to have him with us uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, not in person. Would have been a great pleasure to have you here, Stefan. But um, for the t uh, let's hope next time. So uh, the floor is yours on the Emperor Study Program in Heart Failure, Past, Present, and Future. Please, Stefan. That, uh, dear colleagues, it's an absolute pleasure to present to you the key results of the Emperor Preserved and Pooled Studies and put them in context with what we know about all of this. You know, of course, that SGLT2 inhibitors were developed over the last 15 years to first make a difference in type 2 diabetes. Then we started to see the success there, particularly with Emperor Reg Outcome. We then saw the reduction in heart failure hospitalization with many SGLT2 inhibitors and moved into heart failure. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction now heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in contrast to the reduced ejection fraction is basically ejection fraction above 40%. And we recruited in the Emperor Preserve program 6,000 patients with that. They had diabetes or not, half and half. Patients were symptomatic, had an EGFR of 20 or above. And in order to ensure a minimum amount of risk in these patients, so that really we see events that we can prevent, uh, patients had an NTBNP above 300 in sinus rhythm or above 900 in atrial fibrillation. These patients with HFPEF, they had structural heart disease or heart failure hospitalization, and they simply received empagliflozin in 10 milligram once daily or placebo, and they were followed for 26 months investigating these key endpoints here. Cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization as a composite primary endpoint, or the totality of all heart failure hospitalization, or the slope of change in GFR. These were the things we investigated in this study. Now you can see here a distribution of all the recruitment around the world. This work trial was done in 23 countries with more than 600 sites. It's truly an international project uh, from around the world centers participated and contributed to the success of the study. So collectively, what patients constitute the emperor preserved population? Basically 6,000 6, patients in total, 3,000 uh, in each of the two treatment groups. And the average age was 72. 45% of the patients were women. Half the patients had diabetes, half the patients atrial fibrillation. And when you look into the symptom status, 80% had class two, 20% had class three or four. The average ejection fraction in this HFPEF population was 54, and the GFR was 61. Now, one very interesting issue is how the treatment of patients at baseline looked like. If you consider RASI therapy, 80%. If you consider MRAs, and I'm sure at the conference you talked already about how important it is also to use these foundational therapy in HEF-REF, but now you can see similar treatments in HEF-PEF, 37% MRA use in these patients, and beta blockers a staggering 87%. Now, let's jump to the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint, as I said, is the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. 511 such endpoints in placebo, and this was reduced to 415 on empagliflozin, almost 100 events less, a hazard ratio of 0.79, which means a 21% reduction, highly significant result with a p-value of 0.0003, and the results basically became significant already at day 18. So this was a very fast improvement that we could see. 
If you look into the components of the primary endpoint, you can see here a 29% reduction in the first hospitalization for heart failure and a 9% reduction in cardiovascular death, not quite reaching significance. But of course, you can easily appreciate that the majority of the benefit came from the first hospitalization for heart failure for the overall primary endpoint. Now, we are asked sometimes, in whom does it work and whom does it not work? And the interesting answer here is there is no subgroup of patients where it didn't work. So this is the first set of several subgroups here highlighted diabetes status and sex. And this trial showed that in half pef patients, both with and without diabetes, the treatment worked and got essentially identical results. If you look into the sex interaction as a p-value of 0.5, both for men and for women, the results were significant. If you then basically look at the second set of the subgroup analysis, you can see that prior treatment with an MRA or an ACE inhibitor, no significant difference. And regardless of the precise ejection fraction, patients got a benefit in this study. And this is very good news overall. Now, if you consider, for instance, also subgroups by region, I would like to emphasize that the European region, which was a problem uh, in the Emperor Reduced trial, not reaching significance. Uh, here, suddenly, it is also reaching significance with the same result as the overall trial. So these regional analyses should be taken with a grain of salt. The, they are sometimes very small groups and you should really uh, not pay attention too much to regional results. What about other results? Here we have the first and second and third and recurrent essentially overall heart failure hospitalizations. The hazard ratio is 0.73, which means there is a 27% reduction in this endpoint, which is reflecting the burden of the disease because patients not only have a first but also subsequent hospitalizations more than 100 such hospitalizations less in this trial alone and again separation of curves very early on in the study kidney function now the sglt2 inhibitors are really probably the first class of drugs where in heart failure you have a reliable improvement of kidney function. Here you see the EGFR slope significantly improved in the empaglyphosin group versus placebo. Now, heart kidney outcomes are a different story. I come to this in a second. Maybe our follow up with two years on average was a bit short. So, what about quality of life then? Because not only events count for the patients, but when you start giving patients this treatment, they will ask you, do I also benefit for quality of life? And the answer is yes, you do. Here you see the clinical summary score from the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, and it has significant results, very stable throughout the first year of treatment. This is good news for patients. Also quality of life is improved. Now beyond quality of life, also symptoms come. The New York Heart Class functional classification is one way of assessing the degree of symptoms. And of course, you can become better, but also it's valuable for patients to have less deterioration. And in this particular case, we can see here that there's improvements in both directions. More improvements, less deterioration, reaching good significance for all of this. So the treatment is giving you benefits beyond just re event reductions. Of course, many of you are interested in mechanistic issues. And this is the one slide you may then want to discuss. What about the glycated hemoglobin change? Well, the average change is 0.2%. You might say that's a little, but please consider half the patients were non-diabetic. In the diabetics, it's 0.3 to 0.4, which is normal for SGLT2 inhibitors. Hematocrit, a strong increase. But what many of you may not really know there is strong stimulation of erythropoietin 
using SGLT2 inhibitors. And this is a reflection of this. You might say, well, what about diuretic effects? Well, diuretics effect, they may have occurred early because otherwise we can't explain the effect after 18 days, but the average effect after one year is only a 5% reduction in NTBNP. So making a diuretic effect in the longer term unlikely. Small reductions of body weight, 1.3 kilogram in two years, and a small reduction in systolic blood pressure uh, of one millimeter mercury in these patients. Now, this is interesting because 90% of patients have a hypertension etiology. So let's move a little bit to the other issues like safety or cause mortality. Unfortunately, no difference overall. There were quite many COVID-related infection deaths and maybe the decision to put non-cardiovascular and uh, 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 non-cardiovascular mortality was excluding the unknown death. Unknown death in HFPEF may actually in many cases not be cardiovascular. So maybe there you can say other studies might have a bit better chance. What about the real safety issues, side effects? Well, first of all, in blue, you can see the things that many people are concerned about, but you don't need to be concerned about this for empagliflozin in heart failure, no hypoglycemia, no ketoacidosis, no bone fractures, no lower limb amputations. All of this equal in patients with EMPA and placebo, no problem. With regards to symptomatic hypotension, there is a 1.4% increase in the patients receiving EMPA gliflozin. So maybe we should take more care in adjusting diuretics, those with a borderline low blood pressure. So really adjust diuretics when you start with empagliflozin. And then lastly, genital infections, mostly mycotic in nature, a 1.5% increase, not very much, but you need to know it. They are manageable. People should be made aware of this. So that brings me to the conclusion of this part where basically we can say we have a 21% reduction in the Emperor Preserve trial for the primary endpoint of CV death and heart failure hospitalizations. Other have trials had similar endpoints, but they only had 5 to 14% benefit. And none of them had a statistically significant and convincing result. So for the first time now, we have a convincing win in have We have this win with a meaningful difference of 21%. And it is similar across all pre-specified subgroups, including ejection fraction, sex, and diabetes. This is really the first HEFPEF therapy we have in our availability. Now, this is published in the New England Journal, as you know, but this was accompanied by additional information on the Emperor Pool study. What is Emperor Pool? Well, Emperor Pooled is both the Emperor Reduced and Preserved study together, almost 10,000 patients. And the primary endpoint of that pooled analysis was the hard renal outcomes. And we did this to really look whether not only cardiac, but also renal effects can be seen in a broad population of heart failure patients. Now it's important, and you will see in a second why, to emphasize again that the cardiovascular key outcomes they're very similar and all very significant in the two trials we have now reported on. You can see here the hazard ratios for all these important endpoints, very similar. These similar results and successful results allowed the renal pooled analysis to be statistically powered for the change in GFR above 40% or going down to very low levels or to dialysis. There's one problem. The results in the emperor reduced in the emperor preserved study that we calculated, they were heterogeneous. So the results for this kidney outcome were different in the two groups. And that means we can't actually pool the data, unfortunately. That also means we have to report things separately. Now, of course, you might say, well, I thought that the EGFR slope has changed. It has changed. But usually it's used over three to four years duration. Here we have a two year duration on average. So really it seems we didn't have enough follow-up time for this. 
But maybe there's also a second problem that the endpoint was suboptimal, having too many events that you cannot influence. And why do I say this? Because we are, we are using this endpoint with a 40% sustained change, but other studies use 50 and 57% sustained change. Well, you might say that's a minor difference, but if you then combine this with renal death, maybe the difference is bigger than you think. So look at this here. When we are using the 40% definition, we have a 5% difference. But when we are using a 50% sustained difference, we have a 22% difference. And interestingly, that result is very similar to what we are seeing in DAPA-HF, uh, where, for instance, it was a 29% difference. Let's see what we will get from this, from the DELIVER study. It should be very interesting to see whether we so simply used the wrong definition. So let me conclude by saying we have already a number of paper published. And also I would like to highlight that there is really uh, an interesting additional paper here in circulation, a full paper on all the extended secondary endpoints, including outpatient visits and intravenous therapy use, which were all significant re reduced uh, as well with empagliflozin. So there is more, much more to come on quality of life, on the true HFPEF subgroup, on many other things. It leaves me to say that really it seems there is a strong success story with the SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure. They do make a difference in HFREF, but now also in HFPEF. In HFREF, SGLT2 inhibitors, and I'm sure you have discussed it at the conference already, they are a class 1A indication, but now in HFPEF, I believe the next guidelines, and maybe Giuseppe can support me on this, they should also mention empagliflozin at least, but maybe also other SGLT2 inhibitors if they're successful as well, in HFPEF, making this really the standard of care for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to some discussion. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, th thank you, Stefan. I can tell from your voice that you are talking every day more than <laughs> once. <laughs> no, it, the, we have a question here uh, that is uh, relates to the development of diabetes mellitus, uh, saying that in Emperor Preserve, EMPA did not reduce the development of uh, uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, on the contrary, what happened in Emperor uh, reduced? Uh, any comment on that? Uh, well, basically, I have to say that the investigation of uh, diabetes development uh, in this study probably was underpowered. We had to restrict it to those without any glycemic disorder, which is like 30% of the patients. Uh, we didn't see it, and, and that's a fact. Um, maybe we should reevaluate our expectation in this regards. Stefan, thank you very much uh, for your great talk and your uh being with us actually and thank you for your contribution so the question which normally we have stlt2 and we've just discussed actually before their talk five of them there and now we see this benefit with this particular sglt2 is this class effect because we know with the heart failure with the renal protection and um, i mean do we have i mean can we use dapa for this one or just has to be impa well, um, I should say it the following way. I like it the way that the guidelines have done it. They recognize a class effect for the prevention of heart failure hospitalization in diabetes, which probably means in diabetes, we prevent true heart failure development. And the guidelines that are now published give five SGLT2 inhibitors a 1A recommendation for prevention of heart failure and diabetes. For three SGLT2 inhibitors, where we have data, we basically have a 1A recommendation for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in diabetic patients with HFREF, DAPA, EMPA, and SOTAGLIFLOSIN. And for two SGLT2 inhibitors, we have evidence in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, also without diabetes. Now we have the first drug to show this uh, in HFPEF. I personally would be very surprised if the liver couldn't confirm these results when it comes out in six or eight months. Uh, so I very much hope also, I mean, validation is, is, is what, what every scientist is looking forward to, uh, that this is not a 
chance uh, a selected singular event, but really that you find a, a general new treatment. Can you in the future then use DAPA instead of EMPA or EMPA instead of DAPA? I think yes. Uh, at this moment, of course, from a from legal, from a reimbursement perspective, many people will be compelled to use the drug that is approved, reimbursed, and where you have the evidence. But uh, in general, I agree with you. These, these drugs are, have very similar effects overall. You know, I, I always greedy when you see something is coming. You no, know, with GLT two is you know, reduce the hospitalization as a composite good. But if you look at the different death is not there. Uh, any reason for that, or we're going to see it with the next one, next GLT two? Um, I of course don't know, um, and we, we shall see, and, and that will be an interesting issue for discussion. We have to wait and see for the results. There are some interesting differences between the trials, uh, and I don't know whether you know, but the, the liver study, for instance, allows patients into the trial that had in the past uh, a low ejection fraction, so recovered HEFREF is allowed into the liver. It was not allowed into uh, the emperor preserved trial. We make a strong point about this. So we don't know. In deliver, we will have patients included, also a sizable subgroup uh, that actually got this at the end of a hospitalization when an emperor preserved it is strictly a recruitment in the ambulatory setting. There may be small differences. I personally expect, that's my expectation, that when, whatever is the result for the liver, if you do a meta-analysis, you will find no heterogeneity. So in that sense, you might even say, I hope, and I, I don't want to say I pray for it, but I hope really for um, a little bit better result for some aspects with the deliver so that the combined result is giving much more certainty to the, to the community. But let's not... Uh, how shall we say, let's not become too greedy too quickly. Now we have a positive result in Hefta for the very first time, a big win, highly significant, very convincing result. It's time to celebrate also a little bit. Uh, just a, a quick one. Do you think, uh, staying uh, still on the mortality, do you think that the fact that the majority of the, more, the deaths were non-cardiac uh, in uh, Emperor Preserved could have affected uh, the results. I mean, with uh, so many non-cardiac deaths, so it's very difficult to find any... Yes, yes, we, we, we can. I, this will be, an, an, uh, I'm sure, a matter for a lot of debate and further analysis. Just as an example, we had 160 infection-related deaths in this study, and rather many of them were actually COVID-related. So of the like 800 deaths in total, 160, which is one fifth, were infection related and nobody expects really us being able to reduce these kind of deaths. Um, and there were another 100 deaths of uncertain origin. So we don't know why they died. And quite many of them, honestly, might also have been COVID. We don't simply know. And, and so, um, Yes, in half path particularly, I think it might be more difficult to reduce death than in half ref, uh, particularly with a short follow-up period. The, the M Emperor Rex study, for instance, had three, three and a half year of average follow-up. There we saw a very positive result. Um, this is uh, maybe too short, too low event rates. And let's also not forget the event rate in our trial was lower than we expected. Uh, in, in total, to be honest. That's why also one of the reasons why, why it took one year longer uh, to report the results. So all of this um, uh, is speculation. What is the true reason? I don't know. We shall see whether other medicines in the future can even top this good result and make it even a better result. I don't know. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Anker. Uh, 